Thanks, Tim, uh, very much. Keep Jude open in front of you. We're going to be in verses 17 to 23, as Tim said. And uh, if you want to follow along, there is, as always, I think, yeah, there it is, an outline on the service sheet that you were given as you came through the door. Um, I wonder how you're feeling on the back of um, a couple of weeks in this short book, the book of Jude. Um, I like to think of it as being a little bit like the sort of double espresso of the New Testament letters. Short, sharp, but really packs a punch. And as we've been in it in these last couple of weeks, there have been some quite stark realities laid out in front of us. And it may have been quite a a disorienting experience for you. Uh, Week one, we were exposed to the reality of false teachers in our midst. People who creep in among the church and uh, distort and twist the gospel to their own ends. And then we heard the exhortation in verse 4, to be those therefore who contend for this gospel. Uh, There's a battle, if you like, a fight to be fought. And then week two last week, and if you didn't get the chance to hear it, do download it from the website. Last week, we came face to face with these false teachers. We got to get a really good look at them, what it is that drives them, what it is that shapes their theology and their practice. It was, we said, the autopsy of apostasy. And so now we know, because Judas told us, we are those who are living life in the land of the false teacher. And it may be that you feel a little bit like um, that guy in that film 28 Days Later, or every guy in every um, film about zombies. You know, he falls into a deep sleep, and then he wakes up, and all of a sudden the world is a very different place. He's surrounded by hostile forces, and he doesn't quite know what to do. He's disoriented. And the first part of the film is always about him working out what it's going to look like in this new world. Well, that might be a little bit like what you feel like. We've been told by Jude that false teachers will be part and parcel of life in the church. And now we're thinking, well, what does it mean to live in this world? How are we to respond? And that's where Jude takes us in the few verses that we're looking at today, verses 17 to 23. And his message is a very simple one. His message for us, if we want to be people protected from this false gospel that is creeping into the church, his message is this, ground yourselves in the faith, once for all entrusted to the saints. Or to put it differently, but in Jude's terms again, keep yourselves in the love of God. Because as you do that, you yourselves will be protected, preserved and kept. And more than that, you'll be prepared to engage with those who are going the way of the false teachers. You see, that's the mistake these false teachers have made. They, they themselves have failed to ground themselves in the faith once for all entrusted to the saints. They have failed to keep themselves in the love of God. And so Jude starts this little section by calling on us to remember the false teachers. They are an example to us of the exact mistake we shouldn't make. He says, remember the scoffers. Verse 17 and 18, look down. You must remember, beloved, the predictions of the apostles of our Lord Jesus Christ. They said to you, in the last time there will be scoffers following their own ungodly passions. Um, Now, who are these scoffers? Well, by implication, they must be these false teachers who have slipped into the church. But what does it mean that they're scoffers? Well, it has nothing to do with the fact that they fill their faces with food. They are not scoffers in that sense. They are scoffers in the sense that they... They laugh at the idea that they're accountable to God in any sense. Um, The word scoffer is a a word loaded up with Bible meaning. Read through the Psalms and you will meet the scoffer time and again, also in the Proverbs. And he laughs at the idea that he's accountable to God. And to Peter, a similarly small epistle in the New Testament, a kind of um, sister epistle to Jude, if you like, where lots of these ideas are worked through again, he speaks of scoffers. And the scoffers in to Peter are those who expressly deny that the Lord Jesus will return one day in judgment. They think that is a laughable idea, that one day the whole world will be called to account for what they've done. They deny the second coming. They simply scoff at it. And I think that is probably the same issue in Jude. After all, if you remember back last week, we saw how um, pervasive through the letter this idea of God's judgment was. 
Time and again we were told that God would one day judge evil. He would act against these false teachers who have denied him and his gospel. And frankly, the only way these false teachers can carry on the way they do is because they live in denial of the fact that one day they will be judged by God for their actions. They're scoffers. They laugh at the idea that one day God will hold them to account. And the result of that then, verse 18, is that they are those who are following their own ungodly passions. Again, we saw that last week, didn't we? They, we talked to them there about this um, theology of the gut that they have. Rather than submitting to God and his authority, his right to rule and determine what should and shouldn't happen, instead they determine their practice on the basis of their own feelings. Verse 16 the end of last week's passage, they are those who are following their own sinful desires and now we're told they're following their own ungodly passions. Eat, drink and be merry, they say, for tomorrow we die. Or more precisely, eat, drink and be merry, for tomorrow God will care no more than he cared today. God's not going to call you to account. He's a God of love, they say. He's a God of grace. Anything goes. Don't worry. Follow your hearts. Follow your desires. And the fruit of that is that they are those who cause divisions, verse 19. It is these who cause divisions, says Jude. And again, you think that through and that, that's just obvious, isn't it? It makes sense that it's going to be that way. If you've got a group of people um, who are determined to stand on the faith once for all entrusted to the saints, a group of faithful people determined to trust God and live in accord with that, and then you've got a second group of people who are determined to Um, reinvent and twist the faith once for all entrusted to the saints to move in a new direction then inevitably you are going to find division a schism as it's sometimes called a kind of tear in the life and the fabric of the church and it's really helpful for us to see that it's very good of you to um, give us that reality check after all division in the life of the church is an awful thing it's a painful thing It's something that's to be avoided at all costs. And if your instinct is to avoid division, that's a good instinct. But we need to know that there will come a time when division is necessary, when we need to, as it were, draw a line in the sand and say, no further. We can't come with you. To know that that reality, painful as it is, is a reality. And to know not just that there will be divisions, but that it will be those who twist the gospel who cause them. Um, You will find, if you are ever caught up in this kind of controversy where the gospel is at stake, you will find as people depart from the gospel and move in a different direction, that they will accuse you, if you want to stand on the faith once for all entrusted to the saints, they will accuse you of being divisive. That's exactly what's going on in the Church of England today. As a group of people within the denomination move the church in a new direction, reinventing the gospel and the ethics that flow out of it, they accuse people who want to stand on the faith once for all entrusted to the saints of being divisive. The church is moving, they say. We're moving together. We're doing it for the sake of the gospel, for the sake of the culture. And you wanting to hang on to these old truths, you're being so divisive, so schismatic. But Jude says no. No. It is you who is causing the division, not those who want to stand on the faith once for all entrusted to the saints. So they are those who scoff at the idea of the second coming. They are those who follow their own desires. They are those who cause divisions. And so devastatingly, Jude concludes halfway through verse 19, they are worldly people devoid of the Spirit. What is the the ministry of the Holy Spirit, the third person of the Trinity? Well, in the Bible time and again, you see his ministry is a ministry of uniting. Uh, He's the spirit of fellowship. He unites us, first of all, if we're a Christian person, to Jesus Christ, who then brings us to God, brings us into this wonderful Trinitarian divine life. And then he unites us to each other. And Romans 8 tells us that it's the spirit of God who causes us in our inner being to delight in God's law, his perfect standards. And Galatians 6, it's the spirit who produces the fruit of godliness in us. And so Jude looks at these false teachers and he sees their ungodliness. He sees how they despise God's standards and they divide God's church. 
And he concludes, therefore, that they are those who are devoid of the Spirit. God is not with them. And so these false teachers have departed from God. They've delighted in ungodliness. They have denied God's judgment and they have divided the church. And Jude says, as you look on them, remember them. Remember the apostles warned you about them. And then avoid the mistakes that they have made. Instead, you, Christian person, keep yourself in the love of God. Keep yourselves in the love of God. You see, you might have asked the question over the last few weeks as we've thought about this reality of um, uh, hostility and animosity. As we've thought about it, how is God going to keep the church? How do we know that the whole thing might not get derailed? That these false teachers might not just creep in and break the whole thing apart once and for all? How will the church be kept by God? Well, the answer Jude gives is as the church keeps itself It's one of the things I've um, enjoyed most about the book of Jude is the kind of every member sense of the book. This is not a book written to one or two select individuals in the life of a local church. This was written to every single person in the church. And so Jude says to every one of us sat here tonight, if you feel a sense of responsibility for the gospel and for the church, keep yourself in the love of God, first of all. Verses 20 and 21, look down. But you, beloved... Build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Pray in the Holy Spirit. Keep yourselves in the love of God, waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ that leads to eternal life. Now, in those two verses, there are four commands, but grammatically speaking, the central command is the first one in verse 21 there. Keep yourselves in the love of God. That's the main thing Jude wants us to do, to keep ourselves in the love of God's. The love of God has been a a big theme in a relatively short letter. He started the book in um, chapter 1, verse 1. Flick back there. With that, um, that distinctive description of the Christian. The Christian is one who is called, beloved in God the Father, and kept for Jesus Christ. Beloved in God the Father. And three times throughout the letter, he's referred to the Christian as a beloved person. Verse 3, and then verse 17, and then here in verse 20. And when he calls them beloved, I don't think he's talking, first of all, about his relationship with them. He's talking about their relationship with God. They are beloved in God the Father. And he's speaking about the status that a Christian person enjoys, the relationship that a Christian person has with God the Father. God is not a a distant, hermit-like figure living in a cave in heaven delivering messages every once in a while. He's not even like a, a boss, a boss we get on really well with. He is, says the New Testament, the whole Bible, a father, a father who has loved us. They're powerful words, aren't they? Those three short words, words that can turn a day from a good day to a bad day, words that can turn a, a, a year from a bad year to a good year, I should say. Three words, I love you. And you'll have experienced that moment, perhaps from a parent, perhaps from a friend, perhaps from a husband or a wife, where they've just said those words and meant it, and you felt something go on in your heart. How much more powerful when the God of the universe, who with a word created the stars and the planets, how much more powerful when he says, I love you. How much more powerful, in fact, when he demonstrates just how much he loves us by sending his son to die for us. That is what it means to be a Christian person. You have been loved by God. And Jude says you've got to remember that. You've got to to think on that. You've got to chew on that. You've got to find ways of reminding yourself daily of that reality. You've got to keep yourself in that love because as you keep yourself in the love of God so you will be kept from wandering away and in a direction away from God you see it's very hard isn't it to turn your back on someone who has not just said they love you but demonstrated it powerfully it's very hard to to deny them it's very hard to twist their words if you keep yourself in the love of God you will be kept from going in the direction of the false teachers so Christian keep yourself in the love of God 
now you might be thinking, how do I do that? And what does it actually look like in practice, day in, day out? And that's where these other three commands come in, I think. The first command is there in verse 20. But you, beloved, build yourselves up in the most holy faith. Uh, I guess the image is of, of, a, of a sportsman at this point. We're not going to dwell too long on sports. It's not been a good few days for English sports. But you know the image, the sports person who, um, who hits the gym, who hits the weights in order to build themselves up and strengthen themselves. They take on board the protein shakes because they want to be ready for that moment of engagement. Uh, or the soldier, perhaps, who, who straps on the body armour so they're ready for that moment of engagement. They're strengthened, they're prepared. Well, that's what the Christian is to be like. Someone who builds themselves up. But you notice what we're to build ourselves up in? The most holy faith. The same thing that we're to be contending for back in verse 3 is the thing we're to build ourselves up in. We're to strengthen ourselves in the faith, to deepen our understanding of it and our love for it. Um, They say if you want to um, uh, help someone recognise a fake £50 note, uh, there's someone who deals in money all the time, you want to help them recognise a fake when it comes their way, you could give them a fake and let them have a look at it and get a sense of it. But a better way to prepare someone to spot a fake when it comes is to give them lots and lots of the real thing. Let them get their hands on lots of 50 pound notes to see what it it feels like, what it looks like, what it smells like. Because then they'll spot a fake when it comes their way. Well, so too in the Christian life. If you want to resist the allure of false teaching, if you want to be prepared for it when it comes, don't expose yourself to lots of it. Instead, build yourself up in the faith once for all entrusted to the saints. Find ways of exposing yourself to lots and lots of good teaching about the gospel. I don't know if you're someone who is in the habit of reading the Bible. It's the first and the best way of building yourself up in the faith. And if you're not, why not make this summer a three or four month period in which you try to ingrain yourself with that habit of coming to God's word in the prophets and the apostles, the, one who have, the ones who have passed on this faith to us, why not get into the habit of just reading it every single day? Sit down for, for 10 minutes at the beginning of the day, open it up, read it, ask yourself one question, what does this tell me about God that I want to give thanks for? And then go into your day with those thoughts in your mind as you build yourself up in the faith. Make it a habit. As you leave tonight, head towards the bookstall and grab a book. And again, make it a project for this summer to read a good Christian book. There's um, a whole load of material on those bookshelves from godly Christian people who have digested God's word for us and then presented it in short paperback form. Get hold of a book. Become someone who reads in order that you might build yourself up in the faith. You see, responsibility for protecting the church falls into our laps here and today. And so if we won't build ourselves up, then we can't be optimistic about the future. And so we should. And actually, the way I've spoken about it in the last minute or two makes it sound like a very individualistic endeavour, doesn't it? But actually, this building up process is a corporate endeavour. It's something that we're to do um, as a group, so as, uh, as Jude says, build yourselves up, he's calling on a Bible image, the building image. And we saw it in Haggai before Easter, if you were here for that particular series uh, in the Bible. We're to build, be those who build ourselves up in the faith, or you could say here, build yourselves up on the most holy faith. The faith is the foundation, and we are the bricks, slowly but surely being built together into a wonderful building, and an edifice, you could say. So that we need to be in the process of edifying each other. So again, think to yourself, over the next few weeks, are there two or three people I could just seek to encourage in the faith? Perhaps uh, you could form a, a prayer triplet or a prayer quad or something like that that meets every three or four weeks before work for a coffee, after work for a drink, before church on a Sunday, whenever it is, to encourage each other, to build each other up in the faith and in your understanding of it, to exhort each other, to keep going in in life and in godliness. When you come here on a Sunday evening, do you come thinking, I'm coming to build others up in the most holy faith? I'm going to chat to people after the service. I'm going to head over to food at St Andrews. I'm going to seek to encourage people to grow in the faith. 
Because, says Jude, that is how we will be strengthened. That is how we will be kept in the love of God and protected from false teaching. Keep yourself in the love of God, he says. Build yourself up in the holy faith. Then, second of all, he says, pray uh, in the Holy Spirit. End of verse 20 there. Pray in the Holy Spirit, which I think is Jude's way of simply saying, pray. After all, what other kind of prayer is there but prayer in the Holy Spirit? We've established, haven't we already, that the ministry of the Holy Spirit is to unite me to God. So if I'm a Christian person, I am always in the Spirit. If I have any communion with God, any fellowship, any relationship with him, it's because I'm in the Spirit of God. I don't exist independently and every once in a while step into the presence of God. I am in the Spirit and in God. And so I pray. In Romans chapter 8, if you read those verses, you'll see the Spirit's work there is to cause me in my heart to cry out, Abba, Father. And what is the beginning of every authentic Christian prayer? Well, the Lord's Prayer is the example, is it not? Our Father. I can only pray to God by the Spirit. I think Jude calls it praying in the Spirit for what it's worth because he wants to contrast with the false teachers who are devoid of the Spirit, despite, I suspect, their bold claims to the contrary. They're making these bold claims. You need to know that you can pray in the Spirit. It also has a wonderful Trinitarian feel to it, these verses. You pray in the Spirit. You keep yourself in the love of God. You wait for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. I think there's a couple of reasons why he calls it that. But he's simply saying, if you want to keep yourself in the love of God, you'll pray. After all, think about it for a second. Any relationship relies, doesn't it, for its ongoing health and vitality for conversation. Imagine if I was to um, go home every night after work and sit down at the dinner table and Susie and I were to have a meal together and I just sat there in silence. And she chatted away as she likes to do and I simply sat there in silence and it just all bounced off me and I never said a word. And in the morning when I got up, I didn't say hello to her. I just went off to work and got on with my own business. Pretty soon, and if if you're married, you'll discover this, the relationship will dry up. I'm pleased to say that's not how I behave. You can ask Susie if you want to. But if I did, it would be a pretty dysfunctional relationship. And it would come to an end very quickly. I would not be able to keep myself in Susie's love. So says Jude, keep yourself in the love of God by praying in the Spirit. And then thirdly, he says, be those who are waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. The end of verse 21 there. And this is a key dynamic in the Christian life. We are those who are waiting for the mercy of our Lord Jesus Christ. We don't have it all now. We've got so much now. A relationship with God who loves us but we're still waiting. And we're waiting, says Jude, for his mercy. And we need to get clear in understanding what he means by that, because that could sound, couldn't it, as though Jude is saying, or giving the impression that we're kind of on death row. You know, we're just waiting and hoping that at the end of our life, maybe God will deliver a verdict of mercy and we'll get away. We're like the the gladiator waiting for the emperor to give us the thumbs up or maybe the thumbs down. But that's not what he means when he says, wait for the mercy. The mercy of God, as I think we've seen in the early verses of Jude, is tied up with the love of God and the peace of God. It's all all one package, in effect. So that when he says, wait for the mercy of God, he's not saying wait for a verdict to be delivered. That's already been delivered through the cross. He's saying instead, wait for the full flowering of the relationship that is yours already in Christ Jesus. And again, as you wait you will then be enabled to keep yourself in the love of God. Think, for example, of a a prisoner of war who's been taken captive by enemy forces and, and he lives day in, day out in this prisoner of war camp. And every day the soldiers come to him and they put a document in front of him and they say, if you'll just sign this, if you'll just pledge your allegiance to us and come on board, then we'll give you your freedom. You can live with us doing whatever you want to do, whenever you want to do it. But this prisoner stands firm because word has made it to him that the good guys are on their way that a peace-loving force is going to sweep in one day and conquer his enemies and establish a loving and a righteous rule and so rather than going their way instead he stands firm every single day waiting for them to appear well we need to be people who are waiting for the love of God's 
because as we do that, sorry, wait for the mercy of Christ, I should say, because as we do that, we will be kept from turning, kept from heading off with the, uh, the, the false teachers. You see, we're to do everything the false teachers don't do. They are those who follow their sinful passions. We are to be those who continue in the love of God. They are those who divide the church. We are those who build it up. Uh, They are those who are devoid of the Spirit. We are those who pray in the Spirit. They are those who scoff at the idea of the return of the Lord Jesus Christ. We are those who wait eagerly for it. And as we do all of those things, taking responsibility for our walk with the Lord, so we will be protected from the false teachers and their influence. But more than that then we will be enabled and empowered to have mercy with fear. You see, having protected ourselves, inoculated ourselves, if you like, from the influence of the false teachers, we're then left with the question, how do we engage with those around us who are being tempted to go their way, to head in the direction of these false teachers? Do we, um, do we adopt a, a posture with our kind of our fists up? We're going to fight. We're going to land as many theological punches on as many noses as we can. Or do we, do, we, do we batten down the hatches, kind of go all Amish and retreat into our own little huddle, occasionally sticking our heads above the parapet to, to sort of snipe from a distance at people? Well, the way you engage with people who are heading in the direction of false teaching will depend entirely on the God you believe in. You see, if you believe in a God who is by nature isolationist and vengeful then that will produce in you the desire to fight and to destroy anything that stands against your God if you believe in a God who is morally indifferent then because there is no such thing as moral indifference you will like the false teachers put yourself in the place of God and look sneeringly down your nose at anyone who disagrees with you But if you believe in a God who is in his very essence and by his very nature, mercy, well, that will transform how you engage with people heading in the wrong direction. Have a look down at verse 22 and 23. Jude says, and have mercy on those who doubt. Save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garments stained by the flesh. Now it's difficult in some respects to tell exactly who Jude is talking about. It seems as though he has a kind of a sliding scale of person in mind. There are those who are at the beginnings, um, just toying with false teaching and heading in their direction. They are those, he says, uh, who doubt. They're kind of in an inner turmoil, but they haven't gone that direction yet. And then there are those who are at the other end of the scale. They are almost in the fire. That's an image of judgment. That's how far they've gone in their life and their thinking and their practice, a long way down the roads. And what we're actually to do by way of sort of practical steps is not laid out for us in Jude. If you want to see how you engage with these people step by step, you've got to go to places like Matthew 18 or 1 Corinthians 5 or books like 1 and 2 Timothy and Titus. But what Jude gives us here is a principle that is to underpin every single action we take as far as these people are concerned. He says, have mercy. Twice it comes out, doesn't it? Verse 22, have mercy. And then verse 23, show mercy. We are, let's not forget, those who have been shown mercy. And we are those, he's told us just one verse earlier, verse 21, those who are waiting for mercy. Mercy is our predominant experience when it comes to God. And that then should shape how we treat others. Have mercy, says Jude. But what does that mean in practice? Well, let's think first of all what it doesn't mean in practice. It doesn't mean, first of all, just stop caring about what people think. Have mercy. Don't be so worried about differences. Don't be so worried about mistakes. We live, don't we, in a postmodern culture where um, uh, everyone's right all the time. And um, the biggest taboo is to disagree with someone. To call someone out and say you're wrong is politically extremely incorrect. And so again, in these settings where we're disagreeing with people 
and calling people out for um, mistakes that they're making, we will find time and again the accusation comes at us, you're being so judgmental. Don't be so judgmental. And then people will trot out that well-known verse, often the only verse people know in the Bible, judge not, lest you yourself be judged, they say. Now, there is a right sense in which we need to hear that message. There would be an irony, wouldn't there, if we were to become like these false teachers. We established last week, didn't we, their big mistake. They put themselves in the place of God. They stand over others in judgments. They are the ones who determine what is right and what is wrong. And we mustn't make their mistake. But that doesn't mean we should suddenly lack discernment. Jude has written his letter so that we're discerning. Indeed, you could say most of the New Testament has been written in order to help the church of God be discerning, not judgmental, but discerning. We don't forget about people's errors and dismiss people's errors because we love them. No, rather because we love them, we care about their mistakes and we care about their errors. So having mercy on people does not mean suddenly becoming undiscerning. Nor, secondly, does it mean beginning to flirt with their lifestyle. Jude, I think, is aware of the, the possibility of seduction. He knows that we're not immune from the allure of false teaching. I guess he knows that as we begin to think about how we might engage with and help people who are heading down this path towards the fire, he knows that it's possible that the, the, the siren voices of a sinful lifestyle might drag us onto the rocks of judgment themselves. Verse 23, look at it again. He says, therefore, save others by snatching them out of the fire. To others show mercy with fear, hating even the garment stained by the flesh. Be realistic about yourself, he says. Be realistic. Understand that there's the very real possibility you yourself might be seduced by this teaching predominated by sinful desires. We've all got them after all. Be realistic and as a consequence develop in yourself a healthy distaste for ungodliness. When you see ungodly practices flowing out from a distorted gospel, learn to hate it. Not the person themselves, but the practices. And as you hate them, you will be kept from contamination. We hate the practices, the garments stained even by the flesh. But we do not hate the person. No, rather, says Jude twice, have mercy. Which means, I think, in practice, we have as an ambition for every single person we meet and engage with, we have as an ambition for them their salvation. And as we have that ambition for them, so we will find that works its way out into our manner and to our message. If you like, as we look at these people walking this path of false teaching, we will say in our hearts, there but for the grace of God go I. We are people who have been shown mercy. We are people who are waiting for mercy. And so, as we look at people heading away from the mercy of God, our hearts should be filled not with hatred, not with self-righteousness, not with judgmentalism, not with a desire to go out and fight, but rather with compassion, with love, with mercy. And then in a manner that befits the gospel we believe in, we will seek to lead people back to the Lord Jesus Christ and the mercy that's found only in him. So let me ask you as we close, do you know someone who is a doubter as Jude would refer to it, someone who is beginning to toy with false teaching, someone perhaps who goes to a church where false teaching has found its way in, could you, in love and compassion, slowly perhaps, patiently, gently, but certainly, seek to get alongside that person and lead them away from the false gospel and back towards good and right teaching? Do you know someone who is even further down that road, caught up in a church where false teaching is rife, caught up in practices that are the result of false teaching. Could you, again, get alongside that person, lovingly, gently, carefully, trying to lead them back to the Lord Jesus Christ and mercy in him? Do you know someone perhaps who's coming to London this year for the first time who's been influenced in other places, who could come here or to another church where the gospel is faithfully taught and be built up again? Could you snatch people from the fire? Jude says we should. Indeed, do you know of a false teacher who maybe it is right to keep our distance from, but for whom you could pray 
that God would show mercy to them. Because you see, the fact of the matter is that Jude is not on a witch hunt. Jude is not looking out for people he can have a fight with, for people he can take down. Quite the opposite. Jude's desire is that everyone, if possible, come back to the mercy of God's. There are right times, the New Testament says, for us to draw distance from people. There are right times for strong words against people. But even in the midst of those times, our desire, our ambition for people is always God's mercy. We draw distance, we speak against people because we want them to become aware of exactly the peril that they're in in order that they might come back to the Lord Jesus. And so as people who live life in the land of the false teachers. Let's be people ourselves who ground ourselves in the faith, who keep ourselves in the love of God, and who, as we do that, then let that mercy flow out to others. Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we thank you for the opportunity that this evening represents to spend time thinking about your mercy to us. Uh, That every song and prayer and word that's been spoken has reminded us of your love for us. And we pray that from tonight onwards you would enable us to be those who keep ourselves in that love. Give us a concern for each other that we would build uh, each other up. Give us a love for you that would see us praying regularly in the Spirit on our own and together. Our Father, keep us waiting for the day that the Lord Jesus will return and show us that wonderful mercy that we enjoy today. And we pray, Lord, and ask that you would make us people who are merciful, who let that same mercy spill out to others. Please, Lord, as you've laid people on our hearts tonight, empower us and strengthen us to go towards them, not in a a spirit of judgmentalism or self-righteousness, but out of love and compassion convinced of the truth and determined to contend for it but determined as well to lead people away from your judgments and back towards mercy and we ask all of this in Jesus precious name amen